The Buddha's instructions on right mindfulness are basically his directions for getting the mind into right concentration. It says you stay focused on the body in and of itself. And here we're going to take the breath as our object. And you put aside greed and distress with reference to the world. In other words, anything that's not related to the breath, anything that's related to the world right now, just put it aside. Those are the two activities you do, the focusing and the putting aside. And then you bring three qualities to these activities. The first is your ardent. You try to do this well. The second is that you're alert. You're watching what you're actually doing and the results you're getting. And then you're mindful. You try to remember what you're doing. You try to remember to stay with the breath and remember to put other things away. It's all about activities. It's what you're doing. Your focus is on what you're doing to remember what you should be doing, and you try to do it well. So with the breath, this means being sensitive to how the breathing feels in the body. And the Buddha doesn't say that you have to focus on any particular spot. You can focus anywhere in the body where the sensation of the breathing feels good, or at least the sensation of the breathing is prominent. You can follow it carefully, clearly, knowing now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out. And as you stay with the breath, you find that the more continuous your focus on the breath, the more comfortable the breath becomes. But if you've got a rhythm of breathing that doesn't feel good, you can change. You can try long breathing for a while and see how that feels. Short breathing, see how that feels. Heavy, light, fast, slow, deep, shallow. Experiment. This is what alertness is for. You do something and then you watch the results. You see the connection between what you're doing and the results you're getting. And once you find a rhythm that feels good, you stick with it. And then you can think of that sense of ease spreading through the body. And John Lee has you think of the breath going down the nerves, down the spine, out the legs, out to the tips of the toes, down the shoulders, down the arms, in the middle of the torso. Because what we're trying to develop here is a whole body awareness, where the sense of ease fills the body, your awareness fills the body. And in a John Lee's phrase, use the breath as a solvent to get that ease to spread out throughout the body. And then you try to maintain this. This too requires mindfulness, alertness, ardency. You really don't let anything else come in to interfere. You try to do this as well as you can. And whatever techniques you've learned to help stay with the breath, keep the breath comfortable, you try to remember those. And then you're alert to what you're doing. This quality of alertness is important to understand. Sometimes you hear it translated as just being aware of whatever is happening in the present moment. But the Buddha's focus is more specific, as if you're focused on what you're doing. Because what you're doing is the issue in all the practice. You're already creating suffering. And the purpose of the practice is to change your actions. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha was so insistent on the importance of his teachings on karma. He wasn't the sort of person who would go out and pick fights with other people, but he would go out and debate with people who heard, taught that karma didn't give any results, or that everything you experienced now was 
totally the result of past action, which meant that you had no choices in the present moment. Because after all, he's teaching a path of action that leads to the end of suffering. Changing your actions from actions that cause suffering to actions that put an end to it. And so if you want to understand his teachings on different topics, it's always good to see how they relate to his teachings on karma. Prime example is his teachings on self and not self. We tend to think of self as a thing and not self as the absence of that thing. But he saw your sense of self as an activity. And it's one of those activities that creates suffering, but also a sense of self can be trained. So it becomes part of the end path to the end of suffering. Your sense of self is something you do. And as with any action, the question is, when is it skillful and when is it not? And he recommends that you have a self that has a sense of responsibility. And the self as its own mainstay, as he says, at dahiyat no nato. And a self that's competent. That's a passage where Ananda talks about how even though conceit is something we try to get rid of ultimately, still you have to use a certain amount of conceit on the path. Conceit here meaning the sense of I am, in this particular case, I am competent. You see that other people can put an end to suffering. They're human beings. You're a human being. Why can't you do it? You need to have a sense of self that you will benefit from this path. Otherwise, you're not going to do it. That's the passage where the Buddha says you take your sense of self as your guiding principle, your governing principle. If you feel like giving up in the path, you ask yourself, I got into this path because I wanted to put an end to suffering. Have I abandoned that desire? After all, you want to be the person who no longer has to suffer. If you really love yourself, we stick with the path. That sense of self-love, the sense of competence, and the sense of responsibility. Those aspects of self are things you're actually going to need on the path. The thing is that we have many different senses of self. In the Buddha's analysis, our sense of self is part of what he calls becoming. It's a process by which you focus a, a desire on something. And then around that desire you develop a sense of the world and a sense of you in that world. The world relevant to that desire is anything that would either help you or get in the way for attaining that desire. And your sense of you in that world is, on the one hand, the self as a provider. Do you have the wherewithal to get attain that desire? And if you don't yet, what can you do? And then you're the self as the consumer, the self that will enjoy having that desire fulfilled. All this process, this sense of the world, this sense of yourself in the world, centered around that desire, or centered on that desire, that's becoming. And it's a process we do all the time. It's a process by which we were born in the world to begin with. At the end of your last life, your mind was casting around for some place to go. And the possibility of becoming a human being came up, and you said, let's go for it. But there's also the becoming that happens in the mind all the time. And the Buddha saw the connection between the large becoming of your being here and the smaller becomings of the identities you take on in your mind as you think about different things you might like, might want. And he saw that the bigger becomings come from the little becomings. But he saw that in all cases of becoming there's going to be suffering. So the purpose of the path is to learn how to get to the point where you don't need to create becomings anymore, by getting to a place where there's no need for desire. 
It's not that you stifle your desires or deny your desires. The Buddha tried that path and it didn't work. The path that did work was to focus his desires on taking these aggregates, these raw materials from which we create our sense of self. As we chanted just now, there's the form of your body, feelings, perceptions, thought fabrications, and consciousness. Taking these things which we normally just grab onto as a sense of self in that particular becoming, and turn them into a path. And even though there may, become, may be some becoming on the path, this is a different kind of becoming. It leads to the end of becoming. And we're getting the mind concentrated right now. There's the form of the body as your, as your object, the sense of the breath that lets you know that the body is here, the feeling of pleasure you're trying to create, the perception, the image you hold in mind of the breath and the body and the mind. Fabrication, which is what you're talking to yourself about how well it's going and what needs to be done. And then consciousness, your awareness of all these things. All of these things are present in a state of concentration. The difference is instead of just lugging around our different senses of self, we use these things as a path. It's like the difference between carrying lots of bags of cement over your shoulder and then putting the cement down, mixing it, and paving a path for yourself. There may be some stress in following the path, but it's stress that suffering that leads to the purpose, leads to the end of stress. So it's worthwhile. And that's for the part of the mind that says, well, where am I in all this? Remember that insistence of, who am I, comes from part of your calculation. Am I going to receive the results of these, these actions? That's the question. We keep wanting to know, what am I, what am I, how does the Buddha define me? You define yourself by your desires. And the Buddha is basically saying, any way you define yourself, there's going to be suffering. But he's not saying at the same time that there is no self, simply that this activity of selfing involves stress and suffering. And so we follow the path. And he promises that at the end of the path there will be a happiness that is so complete that there will be no need for a desire, there will be no need to form any more sense of self or world around that happiness. The happiness will be totally complete and self-sufficient. And as John Sawat used to like to say, once you attain that happiness, the question of who's there experiencing it, or if there's nobody there, that doesn't occur to the mind at all. Because all our activities are for the sake of happiness. And the Buddhist was able to find an activity that leads to a happiness at last, happiness that doesn't require maintenance. It's total, reliable, harmless. And it doesn't require a sense of self to maintain it. So that selfing activity can stop. The activity of becoming can stop. And as for the question that's eating away in the back of the mind, is anything left in there? Will I be left in there? The Buddha says that once you attain this level, that question doesn't occur to you anymore. You don't need it. The reason you ask those questions is because you're still wound up in the process of becoming, because every other happiness you've found in the world depends on your becoming. Whereas this one is a happiness that, even though it requires some becoming to get there, once you're there, you can put it all aside. The path doesn't cause this happiness, but it takes you there. Just as the road to the Grand Canyon doesn't cause the Grand Canyon. But if you follow the road, you get there. And once you've arrived at the Grand Canyon, you don't need the road anymore.
So you allow yourself to imagine a happiness that's that total. As part of your motivation, you're going to need this to remind yourself that this will be worthwhile. And then focus all of your energy on the path. Because you don't get to the goal simply by imagining the goal. You get to the goal by following the path. It's, again, it's something you do. So be alert and mindful and ardent in what you do. Make sure you do it right. And someday you'll be sure to arrive. <laughs>